and gentlemen, a warm welcome to this evening's Colors of Glory virtual meet. I am G.S. Simhanjana, one of the coordinators of this event. Colors of Glory Foundation is an organization with the unique mission of bringing India's armed forces closer to the hearts and minds of ordinary Indians, probably the first of its kind in the country. We are proud that we have been highlighting India's rich military heritage by hosting numerous outdoor and indoor events during the past four years since we came into existence. Although we have been constrained to restrict our activities to these virtual events for almost a year now due to the pandemic threat, we have made it worthwhile for the participants by hosting interesting talks and presentations by eminent speakers on a variety of topics. And please be rest assured that we will bounce back with all the action as soon as the situation improves. We eventually plan to extend our activities to other cities in India as well. Indeed, we will continue with the virtual meets as well to reach out to our audience all over India and overseas. We invite all of you who are not yet members of our organizations to come to our fold. The modalities of obtaining a membership are available on our website, the URL which appears at the bottom of our e-invites. Be a member and be part of a unique initiative. In case you have an inclination to write, irrespective of whether you are a member or not, we invite you to contribute blogs for our website, which is already rich with more than 100 blogs on India's proud military past. Please feel free to call or email us for any clarifications. Now, before we commence today's event, please permit me to present a kaleidoscopic view of what we do. I now invite our Honorable Trustee, Brigadier Krishna Sampath, to enlighten us on the significance of the Armored Corps Day and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simanji. Uh, once again, uh, very good to say it. Uh, it's my honor to be uh, speaking to you all today on the uh, Armor Day, 1st of uh, May. Uh, as you probably know, uh, on 14th of April, 1938, the first uh, cavalry regiment, which uh, incidentally was my own regiment, the Sindh Horse, uh, was converted from horses to <clears throat> the mechanized uh, elements. On 14th of April, they got uh, their last mounted parade was done and uh, they moved into uh, the um, uh, scout cars. Subsequently, on 1st of May 1938 was the time when the first Quadrant of the tanks were taken over, and that is why 1st May became the Armour Day. Uh, somewhere around 1985, uh, we hear that uh, the late General A.S. Vaidya, uh, the chief who was from the Armoured Corps, decided to celebrate 1st of May as the Armour Day. Uh, the Sindh Horse uh, had their last mounted parade on horses. Uh, at Rawalpindi on 14th of April 1938. I'll, yeah, coming back to uh, this is 
loss and it was an, a regiment which was raised in 1839 and had participated in uh, the baluch campaign the first afghan war the first sikh war and all the campaigns uh, fought uh, by the indian army in the first world war second world war 1965 1971 or uh, to commemorate the armor day at delhi uh, there is uh, this teen murti bhavan which uh, i had a beautiful picture of that but somehow there's some technical problem uh, this teen murti bhavan has got these three statues outside that is called the teen murti depicting the three uh, soldiers from the then hyderabad mysore and jodhpur lancers who took part in the famous battle of haifa as you know haifa was captured uh, though the brits could not capture it using their conventional forces the uh, 15th imperial service cavalry brigade was called in they did a brilliant outflanking maneuver through the forest and attacked with sabers and lances and totally overran the uh, Uh, Ottoman Empire soldiers who were guarding Haifa and captured Haifa. The Israelis uh, commemorate this day in a very grand manner even today, and they were invited to uh, the Teen Murti when uh, the uh, the Teen Murti has become the Haifa Memorial also. So that is as far as the uh, Haifa is concerned, and uh, subsequently every year there is a re. ceremony done by the cavalry officers association on 1st of may in the morning at teen murti to commemorate the uh, valor and uh, sacrifice of all the cavalry soldiers not only in the days of the horse cavalry but subsequently all the battles fought uh, so with that uh, the importance of uh, 1st may and uh, after the uh, rifling ceremony they do go and uh, have a meeting in the uh, president's bodyguard which is the oldest cavalry regiment in india and uh, they discuss issues etc now uh, that was as far as uh, taking you back in history as to what is the significance and why 1st of may is chosen as the cavalry day moving on uh, our speaker for the day as you all know is uh, captain ramachandran who does not really need an introduction to a regular audience there may be a few people uh, who have not heard about him or heard or seen him before nevertheless to link him to the topic at hand he was the second in command of a leading armored squadron during the bangladesh war in 1971 although he was the 2ic or the second in command due to a change of squadron commanders early during the operations he ended up commanding the squadron through most of the operations deriving from his first hand experience of the operations and extensive research he undertook later in life as a military historian he is able to give us a very clear picture of the bangladesh war focusing on the role of the tank units played therein with that i now hand over the proceedings to captain ramachandran sir over to you sir thank you sir good evening ladies and gentlemen uh an armed corps officer can be more proud than talking on an occasion like this and uh, especially bangladesh war in which i was uh, very much involved now the popular narrative of uh, bangladesh war talks about tanks fighting here and there but the the actual role played by the tanks have never been brought out properly bangladesh is not a tank friendly country as you know it's, it's a riverine uh, terrain and uh, the the operation necessarily had to be infantry oriented nevertheless the tanks played a significant role which did not get highlighted because we are distributed so badly with so many uh, infantry formations and units so um uh, let me let me share the screen first before i start, start with the lineup uh ram let's have the slide yes sir okay uh 
So this, I mean, I, I'm going by the standard army format, you see, like um, in, info, info enemy first, like cover Dushman. That is why Pakistan, in case my civilian friends don't know, why you're talking about Pakistan first. So unless we know what we're up against, there's no point in uh, discussing what we have. So here it is. Uh, armored lineup in East Pakistan, the main regiment was 29 cavalry. 45 tanks of M24 Shatri tanks is what they had. And then they had the third independent armored squadron with 14 M24 Shafi tanks. Then another independent squadron, which, uh, you know, we don't have the numbers exact. We, it is partly on presumption. This was about, it was a very light armored uh, squadron with 11 tanks. And that's a PD-76 light of MBS tanks. Now you got Shafi's total 59, as you see. Uh, uh, just, just to quickly uh, run you through Shafi, you know, so that we know what are the capacity and uh, what are each tank capable of? It 18.337 tons. This this I'm telling unladen weight. Actually, it comes about 20 tons. Every time the weight comes, you can add two tons. Then we're going to lay a fully laden weight. Then you got 10 to 38 mm armor. Please note that because when you come to the further, uh, this thing that armor, armor technique makes a lot of difference. What we have armor protection and the 75 mm gun. Gun. This is what a Shafi tank was uh, was of. It was, you know, in, in, in Google and all, if you read about, uh, you know, the Shafi versus PT-76, you'll find a lot of people are giving information that um, PT-76 um, was up against, um, you know, Shafi tanks which are lighter than PT-76. in local. It's, it's all rubbish, actually. Uh, the Shafi uh, was actually it had more uh, thicker armor. It's a heavier tank. And it was uh, capable of uh, a little more, Tank to tank fighting, although it is also a light tank, whereas our PT-76 was uh, more or less a reconnaissance uh, type tank. Then we come to that. Now, next is what they had was PT-76 again, 11, I mean, 11 tanks, 14.6 tons, uh, 7 to 25 uh, millimeter armor, and 76.2 millimeter gun. This was what the total strength, tank strength was 70, what Pakistan had overall. It may be. A couple of times they said that's it, but this was the number they had. Now we have next uh, armored lineup in the east. The information was very, in fact, uh, Ram, who helped me, thought you know it should have been two slides, but time was short. So he led to this 63 cavalry. I've no, I put it on top, not because it is my regiment. 63 cavalry was the uh, uh, medium regiment mainly that we had. 63 cavalry with 45 T 55 main battle tanks. 45 cavalry with 36 into uh, 36 PT-76 light amphibious tanks. Now, just quickly tell you why some uh, one regiment has got 45, another got 36 because light regiments basically has got only three troops in a squadron. A squadron incidentally has got, uh, I mean, uh, three uh, light uh, regiment squadron has a uh, troop has got only three tanks. So the three uh, three troops a squadron has got only three troops. So three, each troop has got three tanks. Three tanks into uh, three troops make it nine, plus squadron commander's tank and the two IC's tank, it comes to 11 tanks. So 11 tanks, when you take it, three squadrons, it goes to, I hope you're following the organization, and especially civilian police. 11 tanks into three, 33 tanks. Then there's a, uh, there's a uh, commanding officer's tank, commandant, we call it, commandant's tank, the two IC's tank and the adjutant's tanks. That makes it 36 tanks in a um, light regiment. Whereas in, in a medium regiment, each squadron has got four troops. That makes 12 tanks. Plus the squadron commander's tank and the two IC's tank, that makes it 14. Each squadron has got 14 into 3 is 42. Plus three tanks, it becomes 45 tanks. This is why uh, the, the medium regiments have got 45 tanks, whereas the light regiment is only 36. Now, 69 armored regiment, again, another light regiment, so it had 36. Now, before I go further into this, let me just tell you about the, a little background of uh, these tanks uh, which were deployed in East Park, I mean, uh, West, uh, Bangladesh. 63 cavalry, now all the regiments which were deployed in the East, traditionally were light regiments. Even 63 cavalry was a light regiment. When I joined the regiment, it was uh, also a PT-76 regiment with 36 tanks. But 
when the balloon went up or rather sheikh mujibur rahman declared his uh, you know civil war in east pakistan war was imminent the army at quarters took a conscious decision that we must have medium tanks one reason was that pakistan may bring in pat which didn't happen because of the efficient uh, naval blockade if patton comes it is 76 was no match now you have seen the different tanks uh, uh, yeah before i go into that you know i'll i'll, I'll skip a few uh, I, i'll just finish this stone and then come to that part of it okay uh, the 69 armored division was there then um, you get one independent squadron of seven cap that is also pt 76 tank 11 all these independent squadrons were also had the uh, same light uh, light with organization five independent armored squadron 63 cavalry that also had 11 tanks five adock armored squadron 63 cav had 14 ferrox scout cars that we will talk to in the end e55 total um, was 45 out there 36 tons weight laid, fully laden weight 38 actually i should have put 38 instead of going for the other anyway 20 to 205 millimeter armor you can make out the difference here. You see, like PT-76 here is having 7 to 25 millimeters armor. T-55 has got 20 to 205 mm armor. This was the difference in the tanks. You know, that's why it's a main battle tank. So then a 100 mm gun, whereas PT-76, you've already seen 14.6 tons. It was exactly ditto. It was tiny spike Pakistan had. We are Russian made the same tanks, 7 to 25 mm armor, 76.2 millimeter gun. Total number of tanks, 139 we had. I hope the arithmetic is understood now. 36 plus 36, two, two regiments make it 72, plus two squadrons, it, it all comes to 94, plus our 45, it comes to 139 tanks total we had, and 14 scout cars. Total armored fighting vehicles, that is AFEs, we had 153 in uh, Bangladesh to accomplish our task. Now, I was in between, I had interjected with something. What I was trying to tell you is this, this decision by the army headquarters, one, one of the light regiments which was there in the east, it was, it was probably the wisest decision taken by the army. This, uh, this particular regiment, 63 cavalry, as I said, my regiment, it was chosen for this, for one simple reason, that sent the longest uh, tenure in the east. I mean, they could have brought in another T-55 medium regiment from elsewhere, but they would like the experience they had of the terrain. 63rd has been there for so long, so they decided to convert it against a deadline, only six months left. But there's a wise decision because we knew the land, but we had no the tanks. They do, it was quite a challenge. You see, the, the tanks were taken off, uh, bombed off, not looking uh, for... Uh, delivery inspections, then you know, you know, training and training the crews at uh, Amandagar, heroing in KK Rangers, you know, sort of raising them to eat, eat, uh, Bengal uh, on, on board trains. This is quite a job. And in fact, uh, for this, this for my particular regiment, I can say that the war started in uh, March 1971 itself, because uh, to get it in time, in October, we were there, eventually, also we were going to go. So this was this how it helped when we we'll, 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 when we discuss the operation. You know how significant it was in the company. It is one part of the uh, armor story in the East. Not that if this is played a tremendous role. That is different. But this is what benefit T55 gave because of its might. It was its its cloud. So we'll. Uh, I hope I mean the the, the lineup part of it. Uh, has become, um, I, I made it clear. Now we'll go on to the, what the war was about. This was the operational plan roughly. And the map is a little disordered because you know, I'm not that tech savvy to, from maps I had, you know, you put it in the slide and you can see here, we had the, the, the moment to take the, the but thrust lines to take uh, Bangladesh was from four corners. Southwest from the Calcutta side, northwest from the Siliguri side, northeast from the Shillong side, and southeast sector from the Agartala side. 
So this, this was the plan. Actually, the original plan, Dhaka was not even an objective. The idea was to, when, you know, the, the, the thrust lines sort of watch forward and this totally encircled Dhaka will fall. This was the, uh, you know, what commanders had in mind. And if at all, we had to take Dhaka, the most likely formation which was thought for was second, uh, two core moving from Calcutta side because here you see the river is the uh, it, it, it narrowest and Dhaka is the closest we could get there. This side was not sorted at all because it's too riverine. But in actual case, what happened was this is the south east, uh, southwest, uh, sorry, yeah, southeast formations which came up. There's a four core uh, general circle things. And this one came up to Uli Padma. And this was um, now the you see this place, I mean, it literally the Ganga, the river Ganges, that literally divides this country into two, you can see. So Pakistan naturally expected all any major in the Indian offensive to come from west, because this, this place, is, this is too much of a riverine country. Nobody in their right sense will try to make, a, make an offensive from this side. So they, 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 they deployed most of their tanks to this side. They showed their independent squadrons and uh, the main regiment, their, their 70 tanks of the main force was 29 cavalry regiment. That was completely dis uh, deployed here on the west side. They even had uh, uh, you know, part of the other uh, squadrons. There are only about total escorts of strength to this side, some Shafis and some B-76s on to the eastern side. The rest of it were here. Naturally, because whether they deployed it that way or not, India had also planned this way because of this fear of the, uh, you know, so many rivers and rivulets. All our tanks were concentrated here also. This was 33 core here with that, this area, north, uh, what we call northwest sector. This is southwest sector. This is northwest sector. This northwest sector was the broadest and you know maximum I and mean, the best tank entry available. So that was where Pakistan had deployed most of its tanks, and so was India had also deployed most of its uh, tanks there. So this northwest sector witnessed probably the maximum fighting, whether in tank or infantry warfare, because when it, when results come in, we only see you know where how it was finally achieved. But the battling that took place in the northwest sector was ferocious, ultimately ending, ending in the Battle of Dogra, which was fought one day after the surrender. That's another story. Now, <clears throat> uh, Captain, sir, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, please let me know when I should shift my slide. Yeah, yeah, I'll do I, I'm, I'm <laughs> still on the first yeah. slide only because I was talking about operation plan only. Yes, sir. I don't know. I, that's why I didn't shift. Yes, sir. Uh, so, we'll, uh, so, that was that. Generally, this was the operational plan to go in from the from these thrust lines. And that what was the expected fight? Here, the as far as uh, uh, Pakistanis were concerned, their Eastern Command here in Dhaka, they did not really expect Indians to come in from this side at all. Because as I said, nobody in their right mind would take that kind of a terrain for an offensive. Whereas they very much expected this side, they put in all their, uh, you know, whatever they had, they, they put in here this side and uh, southwest sector also. Now, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, can you shift the slides, uh, Sam? Um, we're going to the next. Uh, yes, sir. This one shows, as I told you, you know, you see so many battles in the northwest sector. And even southwest sector was not bad. Yeah. Two battles in northeast sector, and far less in, in a couple of battles in southeast uh, sector too. But the challenge of southeast sector was not really the the they, they did fight a quite a few battles, but it was the movement how to get across this. You know, like uh, uh, Sham, uh, Shami Mehta was speaking the other day. He was saying Meghna was looking like an ocean. You see, so how to get across this? Now the Tremendous, innovative, uh, the 
you know, Sagat Singh is more used. One was uh, the, the helicopter, uh, the uh, really lifting of boats, and the way the PT-76 swam across these rivers, you know, at times getting towed by um, you know, barges or uh, boats. That that kind of, you know, the, the indomitable spirit, the, the, the entire uh, formation showed there is what ultimately took them to Dhaka, which Pakistanis were not expecting. And Pakistanis were putting all their strength on this side, which was, uh, you know, we are bashing it out there. Now we'll start with the first uh, part of the, uh, now, before we go into the, um, yeah, I, I'll just show you the, first we'll take Southwest sector, how the battling went on in the, the reason I've taken Southwest sector is this is where the trouble started first. In November itself, we have been given clearance that to go into raw Bindu, because war was imminent, to go in and see, you know, carrying out reconnaissance, even people like me had gone in, you know, taking a tractor, going to see all the tanks, Bindu, and we were doing all kinds of things. In the uh, southwest sector, they were going in a little too much to, you know, crossing on Jessur. Jessur was a strategically important airport. Nine infantry division was closing in on it. And uh, Pakistanis waited, waited, then by the time, uh, yeah, 20th of November, they said, we had enough. They, but they did something which was, uh, you know, which was not done in our tactics. And they had done it, done in a rather, uh, you know, reckless way, they lined up the entire uh, squadron of Shafis and made a solid charge. Knowing there are tanks here, I mean, they're probably the presumption was uh, only PT-76. PT-76 actually is no match for it. And PT-76 of 45 cavalry here, uh, incidentally, deployed here was the 40, uh, was 45 cavalry, uh, the light armor regiment. Along with one squadron of 63 cavalry, that was armored force. And this uh, closing in force uh, of infantry consisted of uh, 14 Punjab. I mean, that's that's what they were, they were involved in the first these units which were involved. When they were closing in on uh, Jesso, they made this counterattack, they launched this counterattack. 45 cavalry, PT 76 tank for extremely gallantly. They, they stood their ground despite their thin armor and fought it out and they, they uh, succeeded in uh, knocking out several uh, Shafis. Of course, losing some of their own. But I was talking about the difference of the tanks. 63 cavalry scout and only one troop came into action there. A single tank knocked out three Shafis in the room. But the gunner was awarded a wheelchair. And the, the, the tank commander, troop leader himself, uh, he, was, he, he was awarded the uh, phenomenal. It was, that showed the might of the tank. You see, just knocked out three tanks in a go. And the only one troop of uh, uh, cavalry and uh, one squadron of 43 cavalry was involved. And uh, they ended up, uh, the out of the 14 tanks, they ended up losing 11, I mean, uh, losing nine and um, three being captured, and they got away with just two tanks out of the fourteen tanks. Two tanks only escaped. It was quite a massacre. And when it, it's quite an iconic tank battle and happening so early in war, it actually demoralized the entire Pakistan army. Now I was telling what role armed to play. It was uh, it, it it shook the hell out of them. Now. Whatever armors, only one squadron that committed, they still had the rest of their two squadrons left there, uh, 29 cavalry and others were. But one squadron being decimated like that, with again, it's matching, only one squadron must decide. But then they realized only just three T 55s and 14 uh, and 11 PT uh, 76s made hell into them. And they, I mean, the Portfolio uh, cavalry overall lost. Uh, Four times, and that two, only three from uh, two from tank battle. Afternoon, the in Pakistan Air Force for the last time made an attack to show there are some teeth, and they were able to. They managed to knock out two tanks. 
by the time the last came and chased them away and uh, Pakistan ended up losing a couple of aircrafts. That was uh, the Battle of Jasur. We call it Battle of Jasur. Some people call it Battle of Garipur. It's the same. The main battle took place at Garipur, but it was from Jasur. This, 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 this is how my action started in 2021 uh, November. Afterwards, this... Uh, now, one peculiarity of uh, Bangladesh operation was no tank unit was functioning as a, a, a rough have you shifted to up cactus lily southwest sector? I forgot to tell yes, you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm showing the southwest sector. Yeah, okay. So, one uh, peculiar characteristic of uh, the operations in North Bangladesh was no armored unit was fighting as a single attack. We had just three regiments and uh, a couple of independent squadrons. And there were so many infantry formations and units. Our tanks were short, you know, highly in demand. You had Delta Skelter, we used to run. You, you were taken out from me. We, we, at times, we didn't know which brigade, which okay. yeah, Maybe because we closely interacted with them, we, we may know which infantry battalion. Otherwise, nothing. Just run, go there, you know, take part, you know. And it, it became task forces of, you know, a squadron to IC meeting uh, groups. Then later on, it became even independently troops fighting at places. This was a kind of fighting. One reason the performance of uh, tanks was no, not known. You know, when the battalion makes their water, they, they records their uh, uh, performance and says, you know, the tank support or the tanks were there. More than that, much, nothing much is mentioned about the tanks. This is a tank story. That's why you know, I realized when later on reading various uh, narratives of Bangladesh war, I realized, you know, the tanks role played has not been uh, highlighted or, or taken into account. But none of the, many of these operations which are uh, treated as, of course, infantry fought very well, but, but which is being recorded as infantry battles. And when, the tanks played a, quite a significant role in that, which has not been uh, brought out. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, <clears throat> that the Southeast, um, uh, Southwest sector, subsequent to this Jesu battle, they carried on, on and on, you know, fighting in various formations that the infantrymen, the, the uh, formation, this uh, financial division, and uh, the entire two corps made it all the way up to uh, Banks of Patma here. They were planned to cross, I mean, that was the original plan, hurrying across, which was indeed possible. But now uh, this is... Uh, According to various versions, at least what from General Jacob writes, uh, probably uh, the Uber was too keen to cross or whatever. It was it stalled there. Uber advance, whereas Porkur didn't stall. That is that, that's a difference. You see different uh, formations how they fought. Now they next one we come over to northwest sector. So this is where you see sort of who uh, I fight between the. Oops, you know, the heck of a lot of battles which took place. It started with a place called Hilly. You know, it's all heard about the Battle of Hilly. This is where you see, this is called Bath, the Balurgad Bulge. This Balurgad Bulge is a portion of India extending into Pakistan, East Pakistan. And the tip of it is a town called Hilly, which is actually shared by both the countries. One part, uh, there's a railway line running in between, that makes the international border. This side is... Uh, India, that side is Pakistan. Now, we had uh, built up there. Both sides were building up there for one month. They were throwing artificial shells at each other. We were sitting there. For um, some or other reason, an infantry attack, this is Hindi, on the, you know, with, with war imminent on the night of 2nd, 3rd December. And an infantry attack was launched on Space Hilly. So, uh, it is, uh, I reserve further why, why this battle took place, why it should have been, whatever. Uh, it's uh, poor planning, uh, poor intelligence. The, um, it was uh, quite a disastrous battle. Of course, the, the battalion which put in this attack, eight guards, fought magnificently well. It was, uh, you know, the officers showed poor leadership. It was quite a heroic fight. But the point is whether it was recorded at all. So many died. Because that was an, the original plan itself was like, and as you can see, this is hilly. This is the outflanking force. 
you are supposed to outflank this hilly and encircle it, you know, take uh, sort of isolate it, and then it was supposed to fall. This was the logical thing to do, and this is what happened also in the end. Incidentally, this outflanking particular squadron was mine, and uh, another squadron was this side. Going in and circling like that. Ultimately, one of its troops joined in finally when he fell. Illy fell when it became untenable because it is totally isolated. I, in fact, I think four Madras and one of our squadrons and one two, uh, two of those men. Now, when these uh, squadrons are outflanking in pincer movement, 63rd Cavalry, uh, T 55s went in. 69 Armored Regiment, which was uh, taking a a lot of bashing here, you see, trying to sort of negotiate this muddy terrain here, washy terrain, taking casualties. They also stuck out. Once it was, once the tanks were permitted to go on, 69 also joined. And together, these uh, two squadrons of B 55 and uh, one regiment of uh, BT 76, they made. But, I mean, they literally sort of smashed through the defenses everywhere. Here. I cannot say, you know, which which uh, particular enemy outposts were run over by which tank, but the tanks were playing hell into the whole area and ultimate until ultimately they made it to Bogra. That was that battle was fought, the Bogra here. That battle was fought after uh, the surrender. So this uh, incidentally. Mogra, only one squadron of uh, 63 cavalry participated in it. The other two squadrons, the one mine, that is C squadron, and another B squadron, which was fighting in, uh, which we saw before Southwest here, which took part in the Battle of uh, Miripur and Jasur and all. They both, we both were withdrawn, uh, Brown squadron on 10th and ours on 12th, taken out and rushed to. West, where tanks were badly required. Here, victory was in sight. So they decided, we don't need these tanks anymore. So we had done our job, we had taken on. So technically speaking, I fought for only uh, until 12th. And the Brown squad the people only until 10th. And we were loaded and sent off this thing. We heard about, uh, you know, surrender and this thing while on the enjoying the, uh, you know, heroes in the railway station. So this was what... Uh, North West sector was. Now we come to Northeast sector. This is a, a this is quite an ad hoc sector, as much as an ad hoc formation. We got uh, our senior working Colonel Kishore Swami here who fought in this particular uh, uh, sector. One on one form zone area, which was a peacetime formation. There was a last minute decision taken to uh, mobilize it as an operational formation. And units were brought in here, from here and there, and you know, they, they made a, a complete, uh, you know, battle formation with out of the uh, east time formation. They did pretty well. You can see them coming all the way up to until they linked up with Indian paratroopers towards the end of the war when they landed up in Tangail, they went up to that place. And uh, I believe people like Colonel Kishore Swami were there in Dhaka when they surrendered. So this was um, the northeast sector, complementing for the efforts on the southeast sector. Southeast sector is the one which finally uh, sort of made the change. In, uh, yeah, again, because no, actually, northeast sector, the sector I was talking about, you know, there wasn't much to talk about tanks, so, but we did have something to put. We had a, a, a dog squadron, five a dog squadron. I'll, this one, you see, uh, five independent squadron of 63 cavalry was fighting in the southwest sector with the division. This was this particular unit was with ferret scout cars. These ferret scout cars are actually, um, you know, it's a wonderful machine. It's a, it's got a Rolls Royce engine which runs at 150 miles and um, uh, 360 degree revolving turret. But only, but no main arm, only main gun. And got run flat tires, which can run uh, up to 50 kilometers after being shot up. It, it, uh, in fact, uh, I served with this squadron in uh, 
surang in, in the foothills in Orange. I used to take one of these armored cars and drive down the road to uh, Silchar at 150 miles an hour, overtaking ambassadors and fear, giving them a scare. What is this behemoth driving off at that speed? So that's it's a beautiful vehicle. It's got independence of such all over and such a burning radius in the hills it can turn around. It was, it was basically for convoy protection and uh, counterinsurgency operation. It was deployed in uh, first in Mizoram, later on in Nagaland. It was never meant for war. But when it was taken out, taken for war, the, it was nothing much was expected out of it. Just a morale booster for infantry and uh, uh, some supporting fire from the Browning is all there that they had. But it so happened, they went on to. Uh, there were some real improvisations. And the uh, captain, my, my ghost, the captain, the, 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 the Singh was commanding a squadron. He went on to tie bamboos to the uh, turrets and um, parade this at a distance. Enemy. So, giving the impression this uh, formation here has some tanks. And it, I believe the rules work once in a while, you know, the, the position being given up, giving the tanks are coming. And they were there, they, they showed excellent uh, driving skills and they were able to keep with whatever country tracks available in the infantry. They were right until uh, almost hung in, then uh, they pulled back. This was uh, the five ad hoc squadron, which, which we showed, you know, which was made out of five independent squadron with, you know, with regimental resources and temporarily raised, that is, as the name implies, ad hoc squadron. Um, then, yeah, this was the only armored force Northeast sector had. Southeast sector had two squadrons. Uh, the first independent squadron of uh, seven camp and the fifth independent squadron of uh, 63 camp, both with 76 tanks, both fought very well. They have that, uh, you know, they had the, it was quite a driver's uh, job for them getting through this maze of rivers and rivulets. It was as John Shamiwata was telling that day, we have, uh, these were made for European rivers. And uh, here, the, the magna, which runs like an ocean, crossing through that, it's the, you start from one end and you land up diagonally opposite somewhere. This was the kind of thing the, the, the tanks had to do, the light tanks had to do it. Uh, Lotis sector. Then, of course, they, they had this really lifting up troops, and ultimately they were able to get to Dhaka. And how much? The only 3,000 men made it there. You know, 3,000 men, 30,000 strong uh, Dhaka garrison surrendered. So, so this was the old battles of, I mean, uh, the, the operations are about, as you find, the, the each uh, sector, infantry battles, but it couldn't have been won with, it, it, it was all infantry battles, mostly because it, 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 the whole plan was oriented, oriented. But none of them could have been won without the tanks. Either leading the uh, units or supporting, the tanks were always there. For no fault of theirs or no fault of the infantry battalions, you know, the, the, the tanks no fault, they didn't really get the recognition deserved. Lots of actions were fought, and lots and lots of people. I mean, we, we, we had uh, casualties uh, here and there. Here, here, here. In, in Battle of Agoura, here coming from the east, you know, all of our officers were shot up, and you know, he, the tanks were shot up, and he suffered some burns. Overall, the, the armored casualties, especially 63 cavalry, was not much because of our. I wouldn't say it's much heroics for us, you know, it is our tank was literally invincible. It, that's why I was saying in the beginning, you know, this is a vice's decision army reporters took. If they had, the, if whether the, they were as, the Pakistanis were able to get, bring in patents or not, going in for an offensive with PT-76 PT alone would have been disastrous because even Shafis could stop them. But T-55s being there made all the difference. I mean, just to give you an example, one of NCO of mine, he had uh, this HE loaded in his 
Now, most of us had HE loaded as your advanced because most targets were infantry, uh, either from bungers or you know RCLs uh, in, in business. So when then he looked, suddenly saw a Shafi tank at about thousand meters. It was a lot of greenery around. He had no time to sort of change the uh, change from HE to AP or something. He let go. Otherwise, he loses the tank. The turret to the Shafi literally flew off the tank. You can imagine the impact. That was that was the clout of T55. So once that kind of uh, you know, once a tank is so powerful, I mean, in, a, in an article I wrote, I compared it to the Tiger tanks fighting in Second World War against Germans. They were, they were, the T 55s were, were the invincible uh, fighters there in uh, Bangladesh and contributed immensely to the victory there. And so did PT 76 by their capability of carrying troops and you know floating across. PT-76 had the advantage of their tremendous maneuverability and floating capability. Whereas T-55 had this disadvantage because of their weight, you get bo getting bogged down. So for, for, us, for us, the T-55, man, it was quite a driver's battle. Even advancing on the uh, northwest sector, where the terrain was supposed to be fairly good, we used to get a lot of bogged down. And then if, if it is not that Pakistan is uh, just, just gave it up like that, knowing that there is T-55. You know, we, they they threw in a lot of in, in uh, what do you call Jewison's uh, mine. We used to run over. The moment the uh, uh, tank track went off, the gunners were very smart. They're on to us. They will not just shell. They will not waste their ammunition. They will wait for us to come down, try to repair the you know. And with repairing a shed track actually takes about ten to fifteen minutes. You can do. The moment we come out, they start shelling, you know, it's, we cannot. On top of that, engineer officers had come and given us a lecture before the thing that stepping off the tanks, be careful, we know there'll be mines around. And it was quite a narrating thing to once the track sh sheds on the tank, there's a mine gone coming out, whether you, you lose your leg or not, then ultimately you somehow you made it, make it to the um, front of the, uh, you know, where the track is shed, you know, try to sort of and then the shelling would start. So this was this was the kind of battle that you're fighting, and uh, it was not really the the conventional tank battles. Very few. They, they did try to fight with some Shafis and uh, RCLs. At least one place here, place Baduria. We, we talk about uh, Hilly. What happened after that? Uh, Hilly was outflanked, it fell. In Baduria was another place where 17 communities fought a quite a battle and suffered terrible casualties. Baduria was one place, Baduria Crossroads, it will come somewhere here. Oh, sorry, I'm on. Yeah, see. Uh, I'm showing the southeast sector, sir. No, no, northwest sector. Yeah, take northwest sector. Yes, sir. Here, you see, as you come from, towards this side is the, the Rangpur and all you can see. From one route to Bogra, there's a Baduria crossroads here. These crossroads, we had actually overrun it without much opposition. We went through it. And we were going ahead. And then we heard Baduria is in enemy hands. The enemy occupied it. It was quite a running battle, you know, going in circles and circles. Come were called in and they put in a uh, first light attack. And they suffered terrible casualties. And then we were called back to take it again. Believe me, it just took nine minutes. It was a nine minute minute engagement. As we closed in, these people opened up with everything they had, you know, because uh, they, they did try to put up a fight. I, I, I would say a gallant fight. Um, my squadron commanders, uh, thank you, you know, the um, Attack and being stopped out. And we just, you know, closed in order to take the pack of boots, hammer the hell out of it. And it was terrible to sight in the So this was, we made quick work of most of the things, you know, making mincemeat out of them. And the Pakistanis lost their morale because uh, 
it, it's more of our, uh, our strength than, of course, I think Nietzsche said courage and, you know, maybe edited with some, but we were certainly invincible and very powerful. And uh, at the same time, our uh, we had a lot of handicaps like the terrain, mines, and uh, we had to weather through all these and uh, fight. And the tankmen were able to overcome all this do well uh, and contribute to the broad uh, So this year is the T-55. The, uh, I've, I've, that's why I've written T-55, the invincible of uh, Bangladesh. Then, uh, then we have the PT-76, the amphibious legend. Now the PT-76, you can see in action. You see how they, they were just not fighting as tanks. They were carrying troops quite often. Those days, <coughs> some Scott APCs were introduced at the beginning of the war. <coughs> but they didn't see all that much of action. Firstly, the equipment was new. That is, most of these were being done by PT-76, carrying troops. And, and then we had the infantry. This is a typical photograph which, which I've really seen with my eyes. What happens is, even on T-55, we used to have infantry move and all that. Advanced, you know, we, we still don't have, I mean, I don't know, probably things have improved and we have a mechanized forces group. In those days, it was just tanks, you know, we are carrying. And infantrymen, I found, are not very comfortable hanging on to the tanks like that, with jerk and, but they are sitting on it and, you know, the moment it, oh, it, the, the artificials start coming in, we ask them to jump down. So, and then, when we are under fire, in the sense that we are under direct fire, not on, not off of the body fire, we and decided to take an objective wagon as all the route line or whatever. With the infantry following us, the, those were troops. This was a typical kind of thing. They were right behind our heels, you know, they used to advance. A typical case was the, uh, the, the uh, Kirkoi, the place which was taken behind Hilly, when we attacked at last light. It was by the time, you know, through all the mines and bogged down, we went there, it was almost fading light. Uh, Mary Bhattagar was my squad commander, squad master's school. He said, the Ramon was for the assault. He said, okay, assault. 14 tanks lined up and we just, you know, like uh, charged the light, we were just assault. It was not considered the conventional thing, but there was no alternative. The light was fading. And the confidence was, you know, there, there's nothing that can hit us. We just went in and uh, the whole place was blasted. Hundreds of prisoners, you know, the Gurkhas were following right behind them. You know, there, it was interesting to see the Gurkha guys, you know, at times chewing a uh, rebound. Sugar cane, they, at times, and many times carrying our empty shells, which you throw out of the tank, and very happily following us. A moment when they'll come in like that immediately occupied. And mind you, it is not it is the, the, the fight, Bangladesh uh, war at least, it wasn't anything like, you know, tanks alone fighting and taking out. It was a fantastic cooperation between infantry and tanks. Because they were, we were carrying them at any time something happened, you know, we can only go through. They have to occupy. They are immediately there to occupy. Especially built up area. At times we have, we have to wait and send them in. They got to clear up the thing and then we Going and come night, we are helpless without the infantry there. You know, a platoon only, but <clears throat> we used to, the squadron used to harbor a platoon has to dig in around. We <clears throat> got us. It is um, that in the end part of it, I'll come. A tankman's end of the day, a tankman's condition is terrible. We are so fatigued. And uh, if you don't get someone to help us to protect the tanks alone, we have to do our guard duty ourselves. Because I have done it when there's nobody, you know, we only uh, are going with the task force seven times, you know, I myself will take the first turn. <clears throat> because you literally, <clears throat> after that hard day, very difficult to stand guard duty or things like that. So this, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> sorry. That is the chariot of victory at Baka, I said, that is it. that's culmination of the war, as we all know. Now, now, this I have said to suddenly indicate 
what all other factors contribute to this? You know, it's not that, as I said, infantry, of course, as I said, their double partners, as I said, they were with us always. But <clears throat> there were others also, which is contributing so much, without which it would have been difficult. First, the gunners. See, the um, FOOs, I mean, I had an FO always on my tank, um, OIC's tank. Well, the way they used to bring down this, you know, we had, they had this uh, 130 mm medium guns. Uh, it, it, it falls like an atom bomb, you have a mushroom coming. It was quite a morale booster, you see, they shower it in front, you know, and so quickly they have to pick up the targets and start. Now, when I came to 130 mm guns and uh, our tanks only, one aspect I, I about that I would like to put across here. You see, when we talk about the Bangladesh victory or anything, and that all our armies do, we, the Indians as such basically got a tendency to lionize. When we talk about Bangladesh victory, we, we always send Manekshaw, Manekshaw was, of course, he was a great leader and you know, I, I, I him. But the point is, it wasn't just Manekshaw. There were so many people who put into it, I mean, like uh, you know, General Jacob who made the fabulous plan. It was a fantastic plan which uh, sort of brought about the success victory. Now, going back into history, these 55 tanks and the 130 mm guns and things like that, which ensured our victory, or speeded up our victory, this wouldn't have been possible for a former chief. General Kumar Amadko. I mean, he was a gunner, but Amadko, many of us say that he has done more for Amadko than any Amadko officer. He, was, he, he, he had the guts to stand up against the bureaucratic tangles and, you know, make sure that we got our guns and tanks. He, he, he literally modernized the army. Those days, who, those who were in the army would realize that. And, uh, but for that, I mean, he gave a platter to uh, Sam Aneksha to win the war. Had that not been, Sam would have still won the war. That's not a point. But uh, that kind of preparation, which General Kumar Mangala made possible, we got to remember all heroes, you know, who, who made this happen. In the Corps of Electronics and Mechanical Engineers, where I, I really wonder why EME is, uh, you know, counted as a service. It, it deserves to be called an arm, the way they were fighting with us. In fact, our regiment, because of a powerful, very um, well-protected tank, we had only two casualties, only two men we lost. One was one of our NCOs, and uh, one was an EME NCO. Because they were always there. You see, the forward repair teams coming and repairing right under fire, the kind of risk they used to take. You know, in fact, we had an OC LRW who was wearing blacks like us. In fact, all our OC LRWs later on also call, um, consider themselves in, in our regimental tradition. It is they are considered officers of our regiment. They, uh, they in that black dominic, the way he used to go under the tanks and you know everywhere he was there. So that kind of risk. They, they, they're sharing everything. May not be inside the tanks, but they're always there, helping us, supporting us. So the the the, the effort put in by the uh, EME. And it, it is something uh, fantastic in, in, in achieving the victory. Sappers, one doesn't have to say. I mean, they were, in, in my sector, the main thing I noticed was they're tearing at the uh, rail line and making a road because our main problem was, uh, of course, uh, the, the mine clearing was there in some of the sectors. I didn't clear, come across the real mine clearing parties at all. But what um, this main problem for us was the, the Bangladesh roads. They were, they were still in pre-independence condition. And whatever was there has been messed up by the transfers. And the uh, sappers had to make a whole lot of roads and you know, get the sub, uh, the, the, our echelons moving up. Our main enemy, I would say, was actually hunger. I think about 72 hours once I went without any food. Only biscuits and tea. Because these tanks go through all the places the, uh, the vehicles cannot fetch up. Right vehicles. This was a kind of... Uh, Bangladesh warfare, it was as we saw it, and the uh, sappers did really support us a lot with their road making efforts and mine clearing. Now, uh, the last 
human element in the tank crews. That was the concluding part of my talk. I want to talk about tank crews because I'm, I'm almost sentimental about it. This uh, tank crews, to my thinking, maybe all, all combat units may think like that. To me, it was the most closely knit combat unit in the world. Because you see, in the armored core, if somebody from on the ground comes inside, you say, these guys are so informal. There is no such, not much of a, a rank, this thing, you know. You take it. Legged, uh, I was a squad with two IC, a uh, tank of mine. I'm there as an officer. Then I got an NCO who is my operator loader. Then I got a gunner and a driver. Some, some of them may be NCO, some of them may be just so horse. The point is, we are such a close one. Uh, everyone has to know their job so well. And it is, you know, we are such a close with family trying to sort of do things in one. Um, make the thing tick things in. Now, to give you an example, at the end of the day, as I told you earlier also, you're so fatigued after days drive and you know, and then tanks, tanks are not near the main road somewhere. Somewhere, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, tankers will come and fill in, you just park somewhere, it's going to be, the, the, I mean, uh, fuel and ammunition trucks will come and park somewhere. We will have to get it across. Ammunition, and and those from barrels, we got to take Jeriki. He Jeriki and carries five liters of petrol. I mean, sorry, diesel. And you see, it, any, any officer, any officer worth his salt cannot sit there in the turret and uh, have a fag and watch these people. So we join them. So it, it, it is a common sight to see an officer also walking around with two jerry cans or a, um, you know, helping with the uh, stocking of the ammunition. And in fact, the, the, the preferred man for some rest was our driver. Because by the end of the day, the driver, you know, shifting a uh, T55 gear, uh, gear, it required, you know, it, it, it breaks every sinew for this thing with both hands, he shakes like that. By the time he has done that at the end of the day, then he has to go and check, you know, the, the, the engine. He has to make sure that the diesel is filled up. So we got to support him. We cannot, we can try to give him minimum work, you know, to, which I ultimately at the end of it, he, he, he's like a dead man. He, that's the kind of fatigue that is involved. So what I'm saying is, it, it is not just look north and looking. It, it's a lot tough in the armed core, the battle or exercise. Then uh, that that you know, when when you share hardship, you do become that closely. Uh, the the rank structure and all in you, it's dissolves. Not much of a you know, we share what, we, without food. We share what little we have. I remember I had a packet of, uh, you know, the conflicts we carried and we had some, uh, what do you call it, milk tins. And we used to like boil the milk and put it in this, we, that we all made, you know, we all share as the breakfast, I mean, the meal. So we went on like that, that is. And uh, one for all and all for one. Yes, that of course is poetic. Why it is so? Because our... Uh, that it's connected, these two things, the honing skills to cooperation. The training given in, if, if you ask me, from my experience in, the, uh, in, in an armored regiment and fighting a war, because uh, the one reason we may be beating Pakistanis and, uh, in, in tanks were, I think their training is weak. Because nothing like training makes a tank group perfect. It's, as they say, the more you settle uh, peace, the less you bleed in war. You've got to practice, practice. And in tank warfare, there is there is just no alternative not knowing your skills. Rightfully so, when you join the tank in the regiment, you know, we have put through a murder driver first, then a gunner first. You've got to go through all that. And we, that is a culture in Indian armor. Everybody has to learn the trade and just be just as good as the other man. And otherwise, men don't respect you. That's the whole point. But if you can, you know, drive just as good as they do, you know, gunnery, you're just as good as you, radio skills are good, you, you become that kind of perfection when you achieve among the crew, we are able to work as, you know, a, a, a foreman crew works as one man. That is the point. You see, it, 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 it gets you seconds. When a commander identifies a target and he says, you know, you don't go for a huge fire order or something. 
he said that uh, you know one five hundred. By the time the, he has set the, the gunner has set the range, um, Travers right two degrees. He is already there um, with your indication within seconds. The target is there and he says on, he's on that fire. It, it, in three or four seconds, the round is out. This guy, this guy can happen only with, you know, trained to perfection. That is warning skills to perfection. That also makes it, you see, one man's mistake can cost the life of you. One for all and all for one. And the fatigue factor I already mentioned about at the end of the day. It is, it, it, you, you got to help each other. Otherwise, you cannot make a team. And finally, camaraderie extraordinary. See, we, once we work like this, we, we become uh, one man. Even today, I can remember each member of my crew. And uh, years after, 25 years after, only one or two of them were there when I went for the uh, Golden Jubilee, I mean, Silo Jubilee of Bangladesh Jubilee, I went to Coachella. It's, you know, we, we, it was, we were just long, long lost brothers. So this was what um, the, the tank warfare was in. Uh, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't take too much time. You know, when, when I keep talking about, you know, I'd, uh, I get so involved with the tank fighting. So, But I hope you enjoyed the, you know, you got a picture of what, not just the operational thing, but uh, what we tankmen were doing and what we were able to achieve. So that I, I would conclude the talk there. I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to answer some questions you have. Thank you and Jai. Very nice one. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. All uh, right, gentlemen and ladies, uh, I think that was a wonderful talk. Uh, if there are any questions or any uh, clarifications to be sought, uh, please raise your hand and uh, please ask your questions one by one. You can unmute and ask your questions. Yes, sir. Hey, no, I have uh, no question. I just want to really compliment the Ramchandra captain. You know, he's really described how a tank crew at the ground level works, which ultimately forms into a subunit and a unit and makes it into a, a, a war winning factor or a battle winning factor. He's explained it so vividly. Very happy to hear him. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else, please? If you have any generalized question about Dharmat Kaur also, Prime Minister will be happy to answer. No problem. Please go ahead. Colonel Sunda here. May I, sir? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Captain DP, sir, thank you, first of all, for a fascinating first-hand insight. A lot of things which were a first to me, sir. The fact that the decision to field T-55s being one of the decisions which literally won the tank man's war for us was a first for me. The second is, sir, the issue of nine Shafis having been destroyed and three captured is also something that I've come across for the first time, even though I uh, did uh, a combat team commander's course in which an uh, officer from your own regiment was there. And I don't think that this has been highlighted anywhere, sir. If this is the case, sir, that you brought it out, it's a fantastic history. And in the Armored Post Center and School, sir, there should be an oil painting with a small this thing of this battle placed for posterity. Otherwise, this fantastic battle will be lost in institutional memory, sir. This is just a suggestion from my side, sir. Because this is, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a great reader, but I've read quite a few books on the Indo-Pak War and never has this ever been highlighted, sir. The third point that you really brought out again, which is the first for me, was General Kumara Mangalam's contribution. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, which is also a first to me, which was an insight. I'm really thankful, sir. And the other one which you brought out, I think the book which you, I mean, you should write that even though it was an improvisation in the Battle of Hilly and not classic maneuver warfare, how you improvised and put those tanks together and therefore the tank man has improvised and, you know, uh, 
adapted to the terrain and been also contributory to the battle winning factor in the war not that you decrying the infantry you're giving them the credit when you spoke of the infantry tank cooperation but this is the first time i mean uh, after so many years and this being the 50th year that the tank man has contributed so much and armored corps has contributed so much should be put to the forefront and you know highlighted more sir this is i mean uh, really thankful this is my uh, first uh, thoughts which came to my mind which i thought i'll share with you thank you very much sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you no more questions sir <laughs> can, can i make a point yeah please sir ramu your um, brother in arms in the bangladesh war uh, you wounded the tigers and the wounded tiger is very much more ferocious than a live living together a living tiger i face the wrath of the wounded tiger when the armored uh, tanks were trying to assault me when i was in shallow trenches i don't know how many of you have had the opportunity of facing a tank assaulting you i mean it's it's you 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 can we say uh, your orifices are all open at that time terrifying sight it's a terrifying sight and then the worst part of it is you brought out a very fine point that the training of the pakistanis were not or they were not as motivated as our arm force they were probably could have massacred our thing there and defeated the entire operations of mine but providence saved us and one even a missed shot of an rcl gun fired by the paratroopers from tangail which was brought to uh, support my uh, ambush even that scared them the moment they saw then rcl gun is firing they just scooted they traversed their guns and instead of coming and assaulting me they took on to the road and incidentally they got shot up by an infantry weapon 3.5 rock inch rocket launcher and disabled the ta the tank totally two of them i do not know whether the casualty figures of a shafi tank includes the damages caused by infantry men like us because on that damaged shafi tanks we all rode afterwards and we all took photographs what i wish to share with you is that the armored corps has got that shock action and it is very good to say from your side that shock action how do you about facing the shock action yourself i had the privilege of facing it and luckily i am alive and laughing today to tell you that on the armored corps day that armor is the king of the battle and if the king of the battle can fight well like you did well we have won the war thank you very much thank you sir yes yes please you unmute yourself please rowing india who is that There's no name there yeah please unmute Yeah, unmut unmuted. Uh, have yeah. unmuted. Yes, I'm I'm Colonel C P Singh Deo from the Seventh uh, Light Cavalry. Yes, really? Come on. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a course mate of Ramu. Now I was the second in command of the one independent armored squadron which came in from the southeast from Agartala. Unfortunately, the actions of this squadron is not chronicled accurately. I'll just take a few minutes to tell you what yes, all please. happened. just a few minutes we had the pt76 in fact we had 14 tanks not 11 as uh, brought out by ramu because uh, this uh, independent squadron had four troops four troops of three tanks each now uh, we were under 23 div uh, our task was on d day to advance from a little south of agartala smash through the defenses of a uh, uh, reinforced bop known as mia bazar and head for the chandpur port 
by D plus eight. Now Chandpur port is lies on the mouth of the Meghna River. The Meghna River is the Brahmaputra, which enters Pakistan and becomes the Meghna. And Chandpur port lies on the mouth and the estuary of uh, Meghna, where it is very very broad. You can't see the other side of the shore. Now this quadrant, we had a classic cavalry charge to clear that BOP, which the infantry had failed to clear. And uh, within 20 minutes, th three, three troops of this squadron, commanded by me, we charged. In the process, we lost four tanks on mines, and one, uh, three tanks on mines, and one with RCL fire. But we cleared that position in 20 minutes, and the div could advance on that axis, spearheaded by this independent squadron. And we reached Chandpur port on D plus four. And it was my tank leading that we entered Chandpur port and the Pakistanis were fleeing in a, in a ship across the Meghna. We opened fire and sank it. We sank it. And then the air force came in and started straf strafing them. And we captured a lot of prisoners. Now what happened was in, in brief, because of the armor being at uh, Chandpur port, which was behind the enemy lines, the entire front collapsed. And more than 3,000 or 4,000 Pakistanis surrendered. It was, it was so funny that they were surrendering even to the gunners and to the AMC people. So in, in short, this is what the squadron did. It was a classic deep thrust of armor, which we were taught when we were doing our YOs. But the action of this squadron was not chronicled, nor was the credit given to them. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, very interesting. Thank you for, for the update. I mean, that is the case with most of the cases. There's a lot of research. You know, I, I, I didn't get this story somehow. So I was able to get five different Brahmin squadrons and uh, most of the north, uh, southwest and northwest sector. <clears throat> it was still, still a sort of quagmire, only bits and pieces. I, I'll Thank write you. something for you, Ramu. Yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sir, I have a question. Please. Sir, uh, what were the personal weapons which you carried? Like any melee weapon or any sidearm in the tank? Yes. Or uh, did you use it in the battleground or did you clear any infantry through that? I'll tell you, uh, Ganesh. We carry pistols. Officers wear a pistol, and um, the we, 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 I think we had a rifle also inside the tank. But uh, we, uh, the NCOs had one um, uh, carbine, ten carbine, like that. Is so we 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 do not depend much on you know it's only for uh, you know night protection of tanks or something like that. Uh, but I'll tell you since you asked a question, I'll tell what happens with uh, sidearms. We, we, when I had uh, gone out of my tank for a food trekky, because, you know, we had to, we are trying to locate some, uh, uh, some tank troops, so these ones uh, gone off and they could be located at night. And uh, we ran into Pakistani guys. And there was a bit of an ambush. We even lost a man. But uh, in the bargain, I remember trying to, <laughs> I was wearing a coat parka, trying to pull out my pistol. <laughs> it was good because we were, we, we, we were, uh, uh, and it, this is this is a little flop in the uh, intelligence because we were told this is a, a, a territory we are occupied by us already. We are not thinking that you're in enemy territory, otherwise you would have had the weapon out. And uh, I could hardly take it out. But anyway, fortunately, we had our, uh, there was an Maratha ally in, in CO coming with me. He sorted out the <laughs> enemy opposition. We just got, got away with sight. So the, the, the sidearms, which in, in tank crew as such, they, we use it seriously. We, we, we get very little chance to use them. That's what I'm saying. Until, unless we go in for a, a reconnaissance with infantry troops or something like that, then we also got to have our weapons out. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir.
Uh, Ram, you, if you have, there are no more questions, you could probably uh, yeah, play sure. the national anthem because my screen does, share screen doesn't seem to be working in the beginning. Uh, I even know it's not working. But again, this is something wrong with the laptop. I don't know. Can you play the national anthem? I will have to play it from YouTube, sir. If you... No, uh, uh, Bignesh is not there. I guess not, sir. Yes, she has got it. I was not expecting this. Earlier, we may have to go without. Uh, um, uh, are you getting it? Uh, it's. I can take it from YouTube, sir, if it's okay. Uh, I can take it from YouTube anyway. Yes. Just. Yes. I can always read it. You take time. Only it's more or less in a different place. So I'm playing the national anthem, sir. Sir, my audio, uh, Sam. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can be heard. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, you know joining us for meeting. I, uh, I, uh, uh, in fact, which uh, is on so, so smiling. I, I got a, I got a small unpleasant announcement to make. I tested positive for COVID. So, so I went on to get a scan as advised by the doctor. It shows a, a mild pneumonia. So I'm getting admitted tomorrow oh. as advised. So it is uh, not not really getting admitted. The Ramachandra will do a fever test. And according to you, know, thanks to Colonel Kishan Swami and uh, his friend uh, Colonel uh, Mark. Former AMC officer who is helping me out. He is um, he is fixing up an appointment for me to have a test in Ramachandra Medical College. If they find that uh, I can be treated at home, they will send somebody else. Otherwise, they may have to death with me for four days. So I cannot feel anything. <laughs> I was thinking it is asymptomatic. Uh, I had taken first shot of uh, COVID. And second shot was due. Then I one day after exercise in the morning, I felt a little fatigue. So out of suspicion, so I didn't want to take a chance. So I took a test. Then it turned out positive. When I met a doctor, he said, "Sir, you took an HT, uh, what is that? HT CT scan, considering your age and things." Like that. I said, "I'm not getting it." But <laughs> when I came out of the thing, it was there is some problem. Surprisingly, I can still feel nothing. <laughs> Anyway, inside they found something. Might as well go and 
This is uh, something showing in 14. The soldier in you has said that what you should carry on with the show. Yeah, that's, yeah. What you, that's what you told me. Yeah. And that is why I did not make that announcement and you have made the announcement yourself. I know. That I would be compliment you and our prayers are all with you and you'll be a fighting soldier as ever. Yes, sir. You'll overcome, this, sir. You'll overcome this COVID business. Yes, take care, sir. Please yes, take Ramusha, care, sir. Not to worry, not to worry, Ramusha. You'll be fit and fine. Absolutely fit and fine. Don't worry. So, this we wish you a safe recovery, uh, Captain, sir. Yeah, as recover it is, very by soon. coincidence, we have, you know, normally we are having uh, only fortnightly programs. This time, because of Ahmed Kote Day, we have, after one week, last Saturday also, we had a program. So, next program, as it is falling, due only on 15th of May. So, you can consider until 15th, a fortnight we will have a learn. So, in between, maybe five days, I will be in hospital. All the best, sir. All Thank the you. very best, Ramu. God bless you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Please, Please take care, sir. sir. You sure, sure. Get well soon, sir. Ramu, get well soon, sir. Just kindly yeah. keep us updated. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have my phone. I'll, I'll keep in touch with the WhatsApp group. What do you do? I'll, I can share some news on the WhatsApp group. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, sir. It's Take been a care, wonderful sir. meeting having met so many good friends. Thank you very much. Yes. And happy Ahmed Kaur Day once again. Yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. Same to you. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank good night, you. sir. Please get well soon, sir. I got to take this call from the doctor at 8.45. He said it called. So I will retire for that. I'm waiting his call. Good night. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night. Sir, if you are feeling okay. bored, please call me, sir. I'm always free. <laughs> oh, sure, Dinesh. I know you. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night, Good night, Good night sir. Good night.